Good afternoon. Uh, happy birthday, Florence Nightingale. Welcome to this British Library event to celebrate the bicentenary of Florence Nightingale's birth. My name is Mark Bostridge. A decade or so ago, I wrote a biography of Florence Nightingale. With me is a distinguished panel, Professor Lynn MacDonald, editor of Florence Nightingale's Collected Works, who is, has yet to arrive, but we are expecting her. Um, statistician, Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter, and Professor Anne-Marie Rafferty, President of the Royal College of Nursing. They will be talking about Florence Nightingale for about half an hour, and then we will spend 10 minutes or so taking questions from members of the audience, and you will be able to submit questions um, through the uh, questions and answer feature at the foot of your screen. Uh, with me also today is Florence Nightingale, um, a plaster figurine. This is a copy of the plaster figurine um, made in about 1862 by um, Nightingale's cousin, Hilary Bonham Carter. And copies of this were um, disseminated to hospitals um, around the world to, to convey the Nightingale myth. 200 years ago today, on the 12th of May, 1820, Florence Nightingale was born at the Villa La Colombaya at Bellas Guardo, that beautiful um, area just outside the city of Florence. According to a letter written by her father, she was five weeks late arriving, and against her parents' confident, confident expe expectations, she was not a boy. It is appropriate that the British Library is hosting this event as it holds the largest collection of Nightingale papers, almost 200 bound volumes of them. Um, I used to say that this was the largest personal collection after that of William Gladstone, but I don't know where I got this idea, but you, it is enormous. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. Nightingale papers are preserved in some 200 other archives worldwide. She has the longest paper trail, perhaps, of any Victorian, certainly of any Victorian woman. Well might she say that she had enough papers in her house in South Street to cover Australia. And um, at somewhere on this screen, you should also see um, a link to the new guide that the library has produced to uh, Florence Nightingale's um, collection. It is, of course, grimly ironic that 2020 Nightingale's bicentenary year, designated by the World Health Organization as the year of the nurse, should find itself in the midst of a worldwide pandemic in which nurses, as well as other medical staff, are taking risks every day with their own lives in the care of others. Nightingale, once forced to act as a supplier to her own 4,000 bed hospital at Scutari, would have been appalled by the lack of protective equipment. She used the word heroism in connection with great nursing and that is, of course, what we are seeing much of today. There is much that is relevant to Nightingale's life and work in the current situation. The summer before she left for the Crimean War, she worked at Middlesex Hospital in London, nursing victims of the cholera epidemic. If she was here now, she would undoubtedly have been using her pioneering statistical abilities to follow the spread of the virus and plot a course to the relaxation of lockdown. She would have understood the deprivations of lockdown, having spent much of the latter part of her life confined to her room, suffering from the disease she had caught in the Crimea, chronic brucellosis. And of course, she is the patron saint of hand washing. Every nurse ought to be careful to wash her hands frequently during the day. If her face too, so much the better. This is a, a pithy, very characteristically pithy um, sentence from Nightingale's bestseller of 1859, Notes on Nursing. I would argue that Florence Nightingale is the Victorian who has had the greatest impact on our daily lives. The founder of modern nursing, the reformer of army medical services, a pioneer of the visual presentation of statistics and their use in the development of evidence-based nursing, hospital design, the concept of health promotion as well as disease prevention, and much, much more. She was one of the great Victorian polymaths, influential in her writings on religion, philosophy, and the position of women. If I had to single one aspect of Nightingale's work out, which perhaps is, is less well known than it should be, 
it would be the work she did um, from the 1860s right to the end of her working life, to the 1890s, um, in introducing trained nurses into the workhouses. Before Nightingale's reforms, sick paupers in the workhouses were cared for by healthy paupers. Nightingale's innovation, um, and also in her publication, ABC, the ABC of Workhouse Reform in the 1860s, was a striking declaration of the principle that even if you don't have the money to pay for it, you still have a right to good health care. And so Nightingale, in a sense, and this is so little, so not often recognized, is one of the most important progenitors of a national health service. Thank you. I'd now like to um, go over to David Spiegelhalter, um, who's going to um, talk about um, Nightingale and statistics. I mean, one thing that, that is so interesting, and I, I've read your wonderful book on the art of statistics and watched some of your media appearances, is um, Nightingale, of course, thought that reading a book of statistics um, was better than reading a novel. And, and when she said a book of statistics, obviously she wanted good data. And one of the striking things about the, the current crisis is, is it is that we don't always have good data. Yes, right. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a great honour to be able to speak on this you know, auspicious day. It's a great pleasure. And of course, in the middle of this crisis, about which she would have very strong opinions. There's no doubt about that at all. Um, what I'm going to do is to show some slides. So I'm going to share my screen. And I hope this works all right. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about, you know, what would you make of the way data is being used today um, in this crisis and in, and in other other situations. Um, the point about her, um, I'm going to see if this is going to work. Um, okay. Um, she, she was uh, the first female member of the Royal, of the Statistical Society of London, as it was then, before the Royal Statistical Society. In 1858, there's uh, her um, candidate certificate with the, with the first author, first proposer being William Farr, um, who you know, was her collaborator for so many projects. And so um, she is very well known within the statistical community. In fact, you know, the, her work on nursing and things like that is, is of, you know, not really, um, uh, you know, just, that's just a sideline side compared with the um, huge respect she has within the statistical community. Um, and her campaign, so this is what I'd like to emphasize so much, is that her statistics were always used for a purpose. She was a campaigner. She was a one-woman pressure group, although, of course, she spent her time you know, amassing supporters and influencing while never actually having any direct power herself, having enormous influence just through her, her energy and her contacts. Um, and, of course, we know about the reform of the Army Medical Department, healthcare, nursing, and mid midwifery, almost goes without saying, we'll hear more of later, workhouses and infirmaries, as we've heard already, and um, as Hugh Small has emphasized, the input into the 1875 Public Health Act, which we really, you know, introduced the idea of, of compulsory um, uh, um, measures to be taken by people in order to improve uh, sanitary uh, arrangements. I, I'm personally fascinated by the repeal of the Contagious Diseases Act, which is this which was the compulsory registration of, of prostitutes in the area and um, areas around um, uh, seaports uh, and military bases and which she, can, she campaigned with Harriet Martineau and others to repeal and was eventually successful. Uniform hospital statistics, which I'll mention briefly because again this is something that fascinated me, the idea of actually monitoring outcomes from hospitals and using that to compare hospitals. Um, um, India reform, she never went to India but was, was hugely dedicated to land reform uh, and so on in India. Um, God is a liberal, we may say that without irreverence. I love that quote from her. She was, um, uh, you know, she was a dedicated campaigner. Most people actually know of her, I think, through her use of graphics, um, you know, and the passionate statisticians, what she's known as. Um, this is what I like, um, you know, the description of the diagrams of mortality in the British Army, where she really was testing um, this way of communicating as uh, um, using statistical graphics as a way to try to persuade people. And this lovely quote that she says, certain questions of vital statistics by conveying ideas on the subject through the eye, which cannot be so readily grasped when contains in figures. So she was the real sort of generator of the infographic, the data visualization, which can tell the story for a purpose. 
Um, and uh, so th this was, he's got a lovely quote here. None but scientific men even look into the appendices. She wasn't going to leave this stuff to the back of a report. And this is for the vulgar public. Now, who is the vulgar public who is to have it? Number one, the queen and so on. So she, she was using statistics for, for a purpose. She knew what she wanted to do. Um, this is the famous Rose diagram, the coxcomb or whatever, um, in polar area chart. And I won't talk about it. Everyone knows that. Everyone's seen it. In fact, you know, she didn't, uh, she really, this, these were being used in a very similar way by William Fard looking at um, cholera and um, mortality and its relationship to time of year, again, to illustrate um, the seasonal effect on mortality um, uh, early on. And then so she, they could work together to develop this and um, these for her particular, um, you know, for the, to show the reduction in the mortality in the Crimean War after the, from the sanitary arrangements. And, uh, and this was, was to be used as a campaign. Um, uh, we've done a, we did a nice animation of this, which was on show in the British Library for some time during the exhibition of data visualizations. It's, it's a very powerful one. I, in fact, wouldn't do that. I would do a bar chart now, but never mind. That's, that's, uh, what, um, um, that's what she did. Okay, um, but bar charts, I mean, uh, especially horizontal bar charts, which I think are a very powerful tool, very, very commonly used now, using the red to show the British Army um, soldiers having higher mortality than just background mortality among um, you know, Englishmen who weren't in the army for different age groups and death per thousand living. An incredibly simple representation of the sort. I've been drawing those you know, just today we're on the COVID data using exactly the same colors <laughs> and exactly the same format, essentially. Very powerful, a paired bar chart, um, which he used again to convince people. Um, survival curves, which again, you know, we're used to seeing these now. <clears throat> she would use anything that gave the image of just what happened over time of the numbers that were lost by death and lost by invaliding and the effective. So this is a, um, you know, we call this now a multi-state survival curve where you start being effective and you go into various conditions. Again, we're using those now for transplant victims, um, or no, trans people getting transplants, exactly the same way she was using those then in the 1850s. So basically, I think evidence-informed policy, which everyone goes on about now, I think she invented it. The basic idea of, of um, you know, working out, you know, what what evidence could be used to support, or you know, that that did um, uh, give the justification for the policies she was considering. So she and her team acted as really as a research think tank. They designed and tested questionnaires. They surveyed stakeholders. They analysed and presented the data. They lobbied for change. They were they were. This was a lobbying organisation. This was not just. This was certainly not an academic exercise. I think she would have loved what work centers um, who, who would now have got the responsibility for weighing up the evidence and, and uh, um, assessing the effectiveness of different interventions. Um, so, and uh, she, she, her campaigns didn't work, then she would move on to something else. So I think she was an enormously um, um, inspiring figure for, for these ideas. Um, so I'll finish now. I could go on about uniform hospital statistics for ages. Someone might ask me that, and I, I will go on. I just want to refer to this um, animation that I did with BBC Ideas fairly recently. It's, it's got more views than that now. That was put up after it had just been made, which I, I think is quite a nice illustration of, of Florence Nightingale and um, what she might make of data today. Many people might have ideas. I think she would have absolutely loved the data that's available today. She would have been at it especially during this COVID crisis. So I shall stop there and uh, stop sharing the screen and pass back. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, David. Um, we'll come back with some questions in a minute, but um, I think if we move on now to Anne-Marie Rafferty, who is the president of the Royal College of Nursing and also has had an enormous uh, influence on nursing policy in this country as, as the professor of nursing policy. Anne-Marie. Um, we can't hear you, Anne-Marie. Unmute. There we are. Is it, you uh -huh. can hear me now? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Sorry, just to add my thanks to the organisers and also to say what a huge privilege is it actually to be here um, on this very, very special day. 
So um, some of the points I was going to make, Mark, you've made in your opening opening gambit there. But you'll make them much better. I, do, I, do, I, I doubt it. But anyway, I'll, I'll certainly have a go. I mean, clearly, in terms of the broader influence on nursing and society, um, and indeed the, the contemporary situation, I think that the hygiene and her interest in hygiene, of course, uh, stands out as being paradigmatic and very, very important today. Um, you, you quoted the hand washing um, notes and nursing uh, position that, that she was advocating. And of course, that's been a mantra of the COVID um, sloganizing, if you like, um, from the government as well. And uh, the infection control prevention uh, theories and practice that she held, um, I mean, she's, she's there central to our practice today as well. I mean, clearly she was someone who advocate was a contagionist and she's often criticized for not adopting the germ theory. But in fact, later on in her life, she did, uh, she did convert. So, and, you know, at a common sense level, of course, contagionism being the product of sort of squalor and foul air and filth, it does make, you know, it does make sense. Um, and actually, a lot of really sound practices that we have to fall back on today are highly relevant. I mean, she was operating at a time when, well, let's face it, I mean, healthcare had very little uh, you know, effective remedies in its arm armory. I mean, drugs, maybe opium was, was, was useful, but there was relatively, you know, a poverty of, of, not of options that were on the market, because there was a plethora of, of re remedies, but very little that was effective in combating uh, infection. I mean, there were the early days of, of, of disinfections, of course, there was soap, etc. But that's really why I think she concentrated on getting the infrastructure right, which was, you know, around sanitation and uh, getting getting basically a supply of water in the, to to towards and building that into her her design. And design, as we've already heard, was a huge feature of her thinking. She was a big systems thinking person, and she'd be thinking about the pandemic as a global phenomenon. And as David's already said, she would be track and tracing um, and trying to isolate everyone within her, her own kind of gift. And I think that she would be at the forefront of, you know, using AI and apps and uh, data management tools to fantastic, you know, effect. So I think from that point of view, and even to where we see, you know, in notes on hospitals where she actually prescribed the cubic um, distance between beds, the detail of her thinking on what would be more or less prone to attract infection. Should a mattress be made out of horsehair or straw? Should the walls of the um, sick room be plastered with, um, you know, a substance or a material that would attract the, the carbonic fumes and, and, and acid, retain it, or would actually repel it. I mean, it's exquisitely impressive to see the level of detail of her thinking, as well as this capacity to helicopter up across systems. Look, I'm sure she would have been on top of looking at all of the international flight paths that might sit behind some of the, the you know, the pathways of, of, tran of transmission that we are currently dealing with today. Um, because she was a global actor, she was a global activist, and that's the canvas in which she was actually operating. Um, I think, you know, we, we've heard about her can-do-ness, uh, lobbying from David. Um, honestly, I think she would, be on to number 10 and on the problem like a rash. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was expert in logistics. That's really what she uh, had to sort out uh, first off when she reached Scutari. 
and bypassing the then, you know, what was considered an, an incompetent military bureaucracy. She, with the help of the fund from Lord Elsamere, set up her own fund, said, well, right, I'm just going to take charge of this because I can't rely on these guys. And um, she bypassed that. And she was also very insistent on having a different line of accountability into Sidney Herbert rather than the military bu bureaucracy itself. So she would have sliced through that bureaucracy. And even that we have today, she would have been insisting, knocking on, hammering on number 10. And, you know, really, uh, it, Prime Minister giving Boris Johnson the equivalent of a Nightingale version of PMQ's Prime Minister's question and a real roasting. And if, if things were falling short, what well, we know it's been very patchy with PPE, I, I really think she would have said, right, I'm going to take charge of this. And uh, I think she would have done an absolutely brilliant job with her global networks uh, in managing the supply chain and, and, and the logistics. She also, of course, um, was no stranger to pandemics and she had a great sort of empathy for uh, inter the interpersonal, as is evident from notes on nursing. That um, is, a, is a masterclass in rhetoric, I think, um, the way that she nudges the behavioral economics um, theory, you know, underpinning it, encouraging people to feel the, the, the warmth of comfort measures in the home and how to look after people in the home, of course, would, would be a, a vade mecum and a, and a roadmap for, for today. Maybe today, you know, we, we could still take the spirit of Notes in Nursing and turn it into a platform for helping people to look after themselves better, particularly those who've got non-communicable diseases, although not exclusively. Um, you know, much in this, the genre of domestic um, household mm. textbooks, domestic medicine, as was produced even, you know, Mrs. Beaton's house uh, uh, textbook and domestic medicine produced by Buchan. So I think it's in the, the, the genre, reviving the genre of advice literature and updating it so that we are actually able to reach out to people and help them to self-care and their relatives, their, their loved ones, to help them to do, to do just that. Um, I think her capacity, as I've already mentioned, to speak truth to power, um, is, is, is unbeatable, and she would have been absolutely there um, in, in the dispatch, the equivalent of the dispatch box, and just simply getting things done. Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't, one of the things that I think she'd be pretty scandalised about um, is the, the degree of the nursing shortage that we actually face globally. Um, the State of the World's Nursing Report that's produced by WHO um, has, was published on April the 7th. And of course, to very little fanfare because it's all been, you know, rather um, occluded by COVID. But actually, there's, there's the first time we've had a global report. And, you know, the scary scale of the nursing shortage, over 6 million nurses short across the world, is the major impediment to universal health care coverage to which um, we've already alluded, David's already alluded, and public health measures. And I think what she would do is she would just weigh in. She would set about trying to mobilize global support from health ministers. She would use uh, the WHA Assemb World Health uh, Assembly in order to galvanize and press ministers into action. I don't even think she would be satisfied with that because for all of those um, actually who, where we, we set our, our uh, influencing focus at health, she would be next on to Davos 2021. And um, she can would we, sorry, can I interrupt you? Because. Um, we, we may have, that was very interesting, we'll come back to some of those points, but we may have Lynn MacDonald here oh, now. Oh, here, good, good. Are you here, Lynn? Have you unmuted your machine? Well, uh, can, ah. can, can you hear me all right? We can. This is uh, Lynn MacDonald, who has, is the editor of Florence Nightingale's 16-volume 
of, of volumes of, of uh, Nightingale's collected works. So she is, in fact, the, the person who's read more Florence Nightingale than anyone else in, in the world and has done this amazing job of, of providing future generations with Nightingale's actual words, which is what we've lacked for so long. Anyway, Lynn. Well, glad to be with you. And I was certainly pleased to hear how relevant Nightingale's work and ideas and modus operandi uh, would be to the pandemic of today. I want to uh, say a couple of things about, I think we should be well beyond the Nightingale as the great Victorian nurse of the great Victorian. I see her great social reformer uh, who, who really changed the world with what she did. And I would say, uh, part of that is the nursing profession, but let me begin by the NHS itself, which has certainly uh, her importance there has been noted. But I think possibly the best thing that she did was to upgrade the workhouse infirmaries of England. And they were the only recourse for the vast majority of the, of the population. 80% of the beds in hospitals were workhouse infirmaries. And they were terrible. They had bed sharing, infectious diseases, bed sharing. They lacked uh, uh, cleanliness, they, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, she got them raised, uh, had to do it one by one. Other reformers came into it. And leading reformers like Louisa Twining up their goals to merely visiting workhouses to getting them professional nursing. And Nightingale's idea was that they should be of the same quality as the best hospital in the suburbs. So it's not the dregs of charity, but it should be good and it's possible to do that because you can use evidence. There's a census. You know how many people uh, get sick and die and at what, what ages. So she saw it as doable and it's unthinkable that the NHS could have started in 1948, July 5th, I believe, uh, without that upgrading. And Nightingale wanted them as well to be uh, separate from the workhouses because they should be hospitals that people are not, don't feel demeaned into go, uh, going into. Now, she also had a vision, and this goes back to 1866, 1867, long before 1948, but she basically wanted to get rid of the poor law, the old poor law. And it, the National Assistance Act, of 1948 says the poor law shall cease to exist and be replaced by. And what she wanted to replace by was a caring agencies, a, a, a people who are aged, children, uh, have chronic disabilities, etc. They should be cared for properly, not put in the workhouse uh, a, a, as a deterrent. And she uh, really pushed the steps that got there. The NHS was the first single payer system in the world. And even its language in section one of the National, uh, Assert, uh, National Health Service Act is it's a comprehensive system for the prevention diagnosis and treatment. Uh, you know, prevention is there, health promotion and prevention. She was always wanting that treatment is obviously the last resort. And it was to improve the health, mental and physical, of the people of England and Wales. I mean, she could have written it herself. It's, it, it's, uh, it's very important. Obviously, there have been changes since, but it's been a, a model for uh, so much of the world. Then above the nursing profession, she didn't just start the first nursing school in the world, which she did, or write notes on nursing uh, in 1860. I would also like to sneak in that her later writing was very good. In the 1880s and 1890s, she continued. She saw uh, how nursing uh, improved over the years as uh, medical science and public health improved, nursing should, and it did. And she kept up with it. But she started a profession. Before that in the UK, most nurses were quite disreputable women. They were badly paid and treated. And they drank on the job and took opiates on the job and demanded bribes for services. Now, nuns in Roman Catholic countries, of course, were decent people and devoted, but they had negligible training and they didn't touch male patients and they didn't work at night. And, and it really wasn't what you call a profession. Nightingale was motivated by a deep Christian faith, but she wanted a secular profession, a paid profession, and it was well paid at the time. And this was when women could get into no other profession, none. And so she started the, basically the first profession for women that, um, uh, that they could have a decent job, there, would be, there were some benefits to it, 
and they, uh, there would be opportunities for advancement. And that was enormously important. Teaching was nowhere at that time, and governesses jobs were really pretty crummy. Uh, so she uh, made an enormous difference that way. Um, we've got a number of questions. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, one of them I notice is about, um, somebody's asked us to say something about Florence, the, the part that uh, religious faith uh, played in Florence Nightingale's work. And um, before I throw this open, I just, I think what is interesting about Florence Nightingale's um, religious beliefs, which are diverse, wide, um, deeply researched, um, is that they confront the, the mid-Victorian problem of uniting science and religion. Because basically what she says, at least in the earlier part of her life, she changes her mind a bit later on. She says, don't, I mean, this is, this is a very vulgar version of what she says, but she says, basically, don't waste your time praying to God. Go out into the world and find out what God's laws are and how they operate. And that gave her a platform for the use of her own religious drive and motivation in her work. Um, I've got a, a sort of more current question here. Um, somebody has asked, um, sorry, uh, what do you think Florence would have to say about the lack of nursing presence at SAGE? What can we learn in order to present a clear argument for this to be rectified quickly? Would someone like to, to um, answer this? David, you, you, you've attended a SAGE meeting. What do you think about the lack of nursing presence? Do you think that's important? Well, I could also say about the lack of statistical presence, but um, <laughs> at least I went to one. And that was uh, that was enough. And so, yeah, I I, um, I don't think I can comment too strongly. I think the the mean genuine concerns about the lack of, um, of public health presence as well on the sage meetings that the, it has had a, a somewhat of a domination of what I call the mathematical sciences, although not actual statistical input either. And actually, if you see seeing public health nursing as altogether as taking a more um, you know. No, I know what's the term to use when you, you know, it's it's a, a very much um, uh, gr grounded, you know, um, a view of of an epidemic and the way things, um, the actual practical steps to take that you could take to stop an epidemic, apart from and these not being just um, theoretical constructs that you try to model mathematically. Can I just say about the um, spirit, the um, uh, her uh, her faith, uh, you know, it is well known within statistics that people say that she did think of statistics as a spiritual activity, as as one in which you um, you were trying to determine the will of God by understanding the way the world works. And um, while uh, you know many people would not actually apply that faith based justification for that view, the that attitude to understanding about data, I think, has carried on and been very influential because of the feeling that that one is just trying to understand how things work i mean obviously then you try to campaign you try to improve things but crucially that trying to improve things is not just based on ideological belief it's based on actual understanding and a belief and uh, of what will work what will have an impact because of the way the world works and so i think that separation although her approach was faith-based it was an approach to separate certainly from political ideology although she said god was a liberal um, and the, the, it was uh, it was again coming down to this idea of, of using evidence to understand whether you think it's the way the world works either god's will or whether you think it's just the way the world works it's a very powerful inspirational idea that i think has carried on into my profession at least if i can come into this yes there the two are so well linked i must be about my father's business and my father's business is, is repairing the world and bringing down rates of disease and, and death. Uh, I sometimes wondered why we prayed to be delivered from plague, pestilence, and famine when all the sewers of London run into the Thames. Clean up the sewers. That's, and indeed, that's what God wants us to do. If I, if I can come in as well, Mark, just on yeah, the, the, laws of, the laws of nature and this indivisibility i think between uh, um the old, it's a kind of natural theological view of how as david says things 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 work and that must have given her huge kind of inspiration and reassurance at the same time 
that, that there was this plan um, that, that was made evident, or revealed by the research actually, and uh, the excavation of, of evidence through nature itself. So I don't know if that connects to broader Victorian views and, and the, the zeitgeist, or whether it was quite a unique view of hers. I think that's quite an interesting question. But on the sage point, you know, I think there is lobbying currently going on on, on, on that issue. And I think um, having someone who is au fait with how to, multiple competencies and who can cover uh, the experience on the ground and the community surveillance and the behavioural elements of that and look at how it's impacting the workforce, particularly the community workforce um, on the ground, I think would be, you know, incredibly incredibly helpful. Is, um, is, sorry, I was, I was just saying earlier on, I, I, Lynn, before you arrived, I was just trying to... We lost, we lost Anne-Marie. Until, until such point that you, that you, um, that you arrived. And um, I, I suppose I was just thinking, what as the, you know, yourself as the polymath, of the output of Nightingale, what what's what's been one of the most surprising things that uh, that you found in your in your research? And you thought, you know, good grief, I never I'd never have never have conceived of that. You know, what what really surprised you about her? Or maybe the multiple. If, if if I can give you two answers to that, one is that doing that brilliant Crimean War death rates analysis after the war, which certainly led to so many important improvements in saving of life, what has really struck me, which I didn't think of at the time I was doing the actual work, is that Nightingale and Farr and the people she was working with uh, had to get the analysis right. They had, and of course they focused on sanitary conditions and they looked at, you know, longitudinally over it. And the other thing they had to do is they had to ignore the official report, the two volume report by the Army Medical Department under uh, Andrew Smith uh, uh, did not feature uh, sanitary conditions. And indeed, there are tables and charts prepared by Sir John Hall, the principal medical officer who didn't like Nightingale, and they are about meteorological conditions, barometric. Pressure, temperature, humidity. Well, what's that got to do with cholera and, and dysentery and, and, and typhus and so on? Well, if you think that climate is the main cause, what a wonderful cop out. And Nightingale kept uh, speaking against that idea on India that it's not, cli it's not climate that's making people sick and die, it's bad sanitary conditions. Mm -hmm. So I, I found uh, that uh, to be. Um, really, really of great interest. And then on the nursing side itself, I don't think people know how much work Nightingale did on the nursing. She didn't when the school first started, she was working on other things. But from 1872 to about 1898, uh, she had a lot to do. She answered letters from prospective uh, nurses, I want to become a nurse, but mama and papa don't approve, etc. She answered them and she referred people and she encouraged people. And she met with probationers, that is first, you know, the nursing students were called that, uh, after their year. And some of them she kept in touch with for years, decades. And she encouraged them, she met with them periodically when they got into trouble with their administration, which many of them did, you know, they're the mm. most trained team to go into a place. They often got some flack. Uh, she usually managed to save their jobs. Uh, there's one exception, although she did manage to effect a brilliant exit, although she didn't keep the job. And I'm now reading the letters to Nightingale and the problem they bring her. Just imagine being the first uh, Irish workhouse infirmary to get a trained nurse and how they rejoice over getting a second one, etc. It's just, it's, it's a very interesting social history, the problems that are brought to her. And then you also see the kindness because for most of these things, we don't see what Nightingale wrote them. For some people you do, but most you don't. But you'll get the letter back thanking her for doing this, that, or the other thing. And she continued to be very practical. And they, of course, brought her information. 
uh, how does a Berlin hospital look after their operating theater? Mm. She's up to date, you know, by uh, nurses later, they started off at a very low level. You get into the 1880s and 1890s, and they're very savvy. Mm -hmm. And uh, 1897, a, a nurse in a plague hospital in India, Georgina Franklin, she sends her these wonderful letters and describes the inoculation procedures worked out by Dr. Hafkin and gives data, you know, what's the death rate from, you know, this was just from a school. Uh, uh, all the boys who didn't get the inoculation died of plague and those who got it, very few died. So, uh, so she has this network that's bringing her up to date uh, over the decades. That's amazing. Um... David, I, I don't know whether you've got any thoughts. Well, I, Gather well, Mark's back. There's Mark's back, because otherwise I've been reading some of the questions coming up, uh, which are great. There's wonderful things. I'd love to talk about ages about them. But just, um, I mean, am I, can I allow one more minute on statistics? Because mm -hmm. she really is a continuing inspiration to my profession, as you know. And people are asking about, you know, what is the role of statistics in nursing and things like evidence. And, and I, I, I think she is an inspiration because her approach to statistics isn't to do complex math. She wasn't a mathematical statistician. She didn't do lots of clever stuff. What she did do, do was work out that you have to have data and you have to have good data. And so it went right back to just having the information not do it being very clear. And then, you know, in a way, if you've got the very good information, you know exactly what you want to you know, look at, the data then can, it never quite speaks for itself, but it, it, it stands on its own on its own merits then without having to be clever about it. And this is the philosophy after years of doing lots of clever stuff. This is now what I've come back to. And now just think you've just got to get the right information, know its limitations, and then, you know, try to work out what, what it tells you. And I think that, um, yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, it's in this COVID argument, you know, at the moment, I think she would have been, might have some skepticism about these complex epidemic models that people are using. And um, I think might have a lot more sympathy with with um, basic data collection about what was going on in the community and, and uh, in that in that way. Thank thank you so much. I've been asked to wind this up, so thank you all very much, Lynn McDonald, Anne Marie Rafferty, and David Spiegelhalter. Um, to play us out, uh, we are playing the recording made by Thomas Edison's company in 1890 when Nightingale was 70 in which she makes um, an appeal on behalf of the veterans of the charge of the Light Brigade. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. As Florence Nightingale's heart standard to bear the pressure, 1890. When I am no longer even a memory, just and day, I hope my voice may perpetuate the great work of my life. God bless my dear old comrade of Balaclava and bring them Hey, to shore. Love, nice day.